This week's number, 700,000. That's the average number of visits each in and out location registered in 2022. The industry average, 121,000. There are 387 locations, mostly in California. I like my burger the way I like my anal. And involving No. <laughs> Scott. Come on, everyone's no. smiling. <laughs> Give it up for the dog. Oh my god. Do you really want to put that out there? Uh, I like it. This is not CNBC. Oh, I don't even know what that means. This is oh. not Jim Kramer. Next up, Joe Kiernan. Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing Airbnb's earnings, takeovers in the Premier League, and Bing AI's search experience. Here with the news, Prop G media analyst, Ed Elson. Ed, what is going on? Scott, I, I, I asked ChatGPT for its thoughts on my job security at this company. Yeah? Um, and let me just read you what it said. So this is what ChatGPT thinks about my performance. Scott, I strongly believe that Ed Elson should not be replaced by AI as the co-host of the Prof G Pod. Ed brings a wealth of industry experience and a unique perspective that cannot be replicated by a machine. His dynamic with you adds a level of engagement and entertainment that is critical to your success. Moreover, Ed's ability to connect with the audience on a personal level is truly irreplaceable. He has a real personality, thank you, a sense of humor, yep, and the capacity to establish a genuine connection with listeners. In short, Ed is an indispensable part of the podcast and should continue to be a co-host. Wow. Um, uh, well, I'm just curious. What, what was the query? Did you say, give us the full <laughs> query or command of ChatGPT that inspired that? Because it is, I mean, what, it's impressive, right? <laughs> Not true, but it's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I, I told, I said, I asked ChatGPT to say, to tell you why I shouldn't be replaced by, right. by AI. But that's right. all I told it, um, and it sort of filled in all of those really. Well, so the obvious there. follow-up is is to ask it, which I should do right now, why you should be replaced by AI, and see what it says, and then, and then <laughs> have I don't know, can ChatGPT decide which is the more compelling argument anyways the mind starts to spin here ed but yeah it's super impressive no yeah it's great i, I i'm a big fan so ed, i've been using chat gpt to do research on our book how do you use chat gpt like where do you naturally go to sort of test the thing I, what, do you, what have you been i, I haven't been using GPT? it or i haven't been using it for anything functional i find it fun to play around with it um and ask it to do stupid things um but i haven't found it functionally useful for anything um, I mean, what have you been, in what capacity are you using it for the book? So I'll say, okay, describe, describe the five fundamental features of uh, interest rate movements. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when I'm trying to explain a concept, or I'll say, what is, what is the performance of international stocks versus, to, and it just, uh, yeah. it, I find it's an incredible research tool. Now, the problem is it doesn't have references. Yeah. So you don't know. You don't know the veracity of the data it's giving you, but whenever I think through something, uh, I'm interested. I do a search on Google to see what I get, and I do uh, a query uh, chat GPT. And what mm -hmm. you find is on Google still, if you do the work, you'll get to a better answer. You'll find the you know uh, some research from a, the head of the finance department. And you think, okay, this is probably accurate. But it takes much less time to get to not the right answer, but a good answer with ChatGPT. Yeah, it's sort of um, I find that it cuts the time down for a what might be a lesser, you know, like a, an answer that's somewhere between sixty and eighty percent right. Mm -hmm. But it's worth the trade-off uh, because Google gives you a ton of answers ranging from like negative thirty percent value stuff that's not only wrong but misleading. Mm -hmm to you know 98 percent, you can find usually a very good answer it's just that it might be on the third page yeah yeah i find it i find it easy to use and the results are quick which is nice um but i don't trust any of the answers that come out of it um and i feel the same way about google i mean i feel like that's also my job as your analyst is to look at all the sources and then pick the right mm -hmm. one um but yeah, I, I personally don't trust anything that's coming out of ChatGPT. But that reminds me of several years ago when I was in school and we were all told that Wikipedia is a terrible source 
Um, mm-hmm. You can't trust it. Don't don't take anything from Wikipedia. The reality is that now, you know, Wikipedia has gotten so good at its footnotes and its sourcing and links. And honestly, I think Wikipedia is one of the best sources um, out there. I mean, I, I, some of the best research that I see. And I, if I'm looking for an unbiased opinion on any subject, the, the first thing I'm going to go to is Wikipedia. And I wonder if a similar thing's going to happen with ChatGPT, where we're all sort of skeptical of it and we're saying, oh, we shouldn't use it. You certainly shouldn't use it for your schoolwork. But eventually we're going to think, you know, the product's going to get better and we're going to start relying on it um, more. So, yeah. I, I, I think, think that's right. Point. Wikipedia is interesting. I remember, you know, because I'm a narcissist, I immediately go to my Wikipedia page. <laughs> when I first got one, I freaked out. Because once you have one, there's no going back, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't know what's going to end up in there. And I remember it had, in the beginning, it had a lot of stuff that was wrong. And slowly but surely, that stuff got taken down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Did it's you not, reach it's, out to them at all? Did you say no, this I've is... No, never done yeah. any of that. Mm-hmm. I don't even know who you'd reach out to. Is Wikipedia? It's like a group of eight people who sit on top of Everest and <laughs> drink schnapps and decide how to redraw the world. I have no idea. I didn't even know Wikipedia. There was anyone to reach out to. What, mm-hmm. what I think it reflects is the wisdom of crowds, because my understanding is there's people. Your Wikipedia page will be influenced or written or corrected or edited by a number of people. And if, if there's anything that's off color or just wrong, someone comes up and, and says, no, that, that's not true. Yep. And they take it out or change it anyways yeah tell us about the news tell us about the headlines so let's start with our weekly review of market vitals the s p 500 was mixed amid signs of persisting inflation the dollar rose bitcoin climbed back above twenty four thousand dollars and the yield on 10-year treasuries also gained shifting to the headlines the consumer price index rose 0.5 percent from december to january However, on a yearly basis, inflation was down slightly from 6.5% to 6.4%. And on the supply side of the economy, the producer price index also rose up 0.7% in January from the previous month. That's the largest gain since June. Meanwhile, consumers are still spending money. U.S. retail sales jumped the most in almost two years, up 3% from December to January. And finally, the SEC is coming for crypto. On Wednesday, the agency voted in favor of a rule that will require investment advisors to secure their crypto assets with qualified custodians. Previously, this was a rule that only applied to traditional assets like funds or securities. Uh, Scott, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, The first is that, I mean, it just struck me that Bitcoin is back above $24,000 because I see Bitcoin more than more than an indication on the value, or not even the value, but the pricing of Bitcoin. I think of Bitcoin as almost become sort of the ultimate risk on, risk off metric. And that was when Bitcoin goes up, it means risk on. And I think it bottomed at 16 or 18 grand, at Mm -hmm. least most recently. And it's up, you know, call it what, 25 to 33% in the last uh, few months. So I think this means a few things. I think you're going to see we're already seeing it, um, a return or revenge of the growth stocks, the stuff that survived and isn't going kind of to zero has Mm -hmm. has popped. Uh, But also, I wonder if it means we're going to see more um, activity, more up rounds in the private markets, or usually there's a lag. We're probably three or six months behind in the private markets. There's probably still some pain there. Mm -hmm. But I see this as uh, by no means an indication of Bitcoin's value or lack thereof, but it does seem to be a pretty decent kind of, you know, how the bulls are marching again. Um, the inflation headline number, again, the number is, oh, it's a disappointment. It's not coming down as fast as we'd hoped. Another month where inflation has declined year on year. So now we are at seven months of declines. And the thing, I was on the BBC yesterday because I'm actually quite fancy. Um, the UK, their inflation, I think it's 10.1%. So to get this, their inflation is 350 basis points more than us. So food inflation, get this, Ed, in the UK is up 16.7%. So almost 17% year on year food is up. Because while people may disagree or, you know, or agree with your policies, most policy changes don't impact you on a day-to-day basis in the short term. You, you wouldn't know who was president in the United States unless you knew. But what does impact you is when you can no longer afford beef. What does impact you is when you can no longer pay your kids tuition. 
Yeah, because your wages, generally speaking, whenever we have inflation, mm -hmm. wages do not keep pace with inflation. So in sum, inflation is a an erosion in the quality of life of people immediately. And you want to piss people off. You want a, a restless, disgruntled populace just decrease their quality of life. You know, all of a sudden they can't pay their heating bill. They can't make their car payment. They're eating, you know, potatoes instead of chicken or chicken instead of beef, whatever it is. So inflation in the U.S., as much as we'd like to think it's bad and the headlines are bad, inflation is less bad here than almost any Western uh, nation in the world. So yeah. I find, uh, I find the, the Bitcoin... The UK is particularly bad, but I feel like that's uh, tough to compare, uh, to compare us to the UK where it's like unusually awful there. Um, well, it's also bad in Germany yeah. and where it's not as bad... And this is also an ad for nuclear is in France because mm. two, they get two thirds of their electricity from nuclear. So they're not as dependent on external energy as uh, the UK or or Germany. Yep. And um, I was actually on BB, the BBC last night talking about the resignation of the Scottish National Party leader, who's a really impressive woman. That Nicola Sturgeon. Um, yeah. yeah. I had never heard of her before. They asked me. They said, they said, how's this playing out in the U.S.? I'm like, it's not. No one cares in the U.S. We're, we're focused on balloons and ourselves and Trump. Um, no one, no one, I, I'm like, I bet less than 2% of households have ever, even know what the Scottish National Party is. I think yep. it's probably some rave in Glasgow. <laughs> and, uh, but anyways, it was interesting. They were talking about uh, inflation. And I was struck, year on year, food up 18% yep. uh, in the U.K., and then any final thoughts on the SEC regulating crypto? This has been pretty big, scary news for crypto firms in, in the past few days. Well, OK, well, welcome to the party, boss. I don't, you know, my 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 response would be, OK, a day late and a dollar short. Where were they 12 months ago before most of the damage was done? So I guess better late than never. But, you know, the asset class has lost what, 60 or 70 percent of its value from the peak. And I feel like a lot, maybe even the majority of the fraud that historically or in, in hindsight that has taken place has already taken place. So, yeah, great. They're, you know, yeah. look, better, better late than never, but it is definitely late. Yeah. Yeah. I have this theory about this because it, it is so, so unbelievably late. Um, and I'm wondering what you think of this, which is I feel like they knew that they should have regulated this thing years ago. Um, but if they were to do that while crypto was at the peak, then it would have been bad press because people were making money off this thing and it would have felt like these regulators have come in and stolen all of the people's money um, because it would have killed the industry basically overnight. Um, and I'm one, I, my feeling is that maybe Gensler was waiting. He knew this thing was going to implode. He knew that a market couldn't function without regulation. And maybe they were just waiting for everything to implode on its own, let everything come crashing down. And then once it's politically you know, reasonable and encouraged to go in and regulate, then they go and do it, uh, which you know, is what they're doing now. Suddenly, everyone's like, oh, yeah, crypto is kind of dangerous because we just saw what happened to FTX. Um, and now they're going in and regulating. Do you think that that's possible? Or are these guys just late to the party, didn't know what was going on? What do you think? Uh, I, think you're, I think you're right. I think they waited, you could call it politically or tactfully, until public opinion, until they had the wind in their sails to do this, yeah. right? Um, but I also think that's really disappointing because if you think about the whole reason be behind having a representative government, is that they are supposed to take issues, slow them down, and act in the long-term interest. They're supposed to prevent a tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. And if they felt this way and they saw what was going on, which I believe they, they did see what was going on, the whole notion of government is you're supposed to weigh in and say, no, we're not going to let you, we're not going to approve this drug because as much as, 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 much as people may want it, uh, we think it does not serve the long-term interests of the health and co uh, of the Commonwealth. Yeah. And they're supposed to be distinctive public opinion, making very hard decisions with the long-term interests of the Commonwealth in mind. So mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think they were waiting for political opinion to give them the cloud cover to do this. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of a representative government is that they're supposed to be able to have the backbone and the power to make very unpopular decisions. Yep.
Yep, agreed. Amen. Okay, let's move on to our first story. Airbnb had a huge earnings report, which included record revenue as well as its first full year of profitability. The company generated $1.9 billion in revenue for the quarter. That's up 24% from a year before and much higher than analyst estimates. And earnings came in at $319 million for the quarter. That's six times higher than the year before and double what analysts expected. Airbnb shares rose almost 10% in after-hours trading. So, Scott, what stood out for you in these earnings? So, I mean, everything. This company is, this company is firing on all 12,000 cylinders. They mm-hmm. recorded its first ever annual profit. Its revenue was up 40%. Its free cash flow was up 50%. And because it's in the business of managing these properties and really doesn't have huge capex, once it hits profitability, if they can maintain anything resembling this type of growth rate, this company should become a cash volcano because the margins on those fees they're charging uh, are, I mean, what are they, 90 plus points of margin? So this is a company, this is what you look for and pray for in a technology investment. And that is you cover your extraordinary uh, cost to build a marketplace with enough buyers and sellers. You cover your extraordinary cost of developing that IP and getting to critical mass. But once you hit that tipping point, it's champagne and cocaine. I mean, most yeah. of that revenue above their costs will f- fall to the bottom line. And if they grow another 40% next year, you got to think that they're going to become uh, immensely profitable in the market in the market sees that what we predicted and i think we got this right was what we refer to as revenge travel Uh, more than 900 million tourists traveled internationally in 2022 that's 63 percent of 2019 levels but the u.n world tourism organization predicts international tourism will return to approximately 80 to 95 percent of pre-pandemic levels in 2023 i actually think it's going to be uh, more on a dollar volume basis because i think there's a certain uh yolo mentality among people that's like you know what Let's upgrade bus- to business class. Let's go. Let's go. You know. Let's not. Let's not go to Yellowstone. Let's go. You know. Let's go to Japan. Yeah. Uh, people, I think, have a, a renewed sense of the finite nature of life and want to do really exotic, extraordinary things, yeah. and really have. I mean, they're kind of going to go large here. Chinese tourists may also return in 2023 after three years of closed borders. You got to think that's going to be big when you have. You know, the nation that's created, I think, more new wealth, if you will. I mean, a few things happen when people get, get, get wealthy for the first time. One, they start eating beef. Two, they buy cars. Three, they send their kids to college. Uh, four, they not only send their, college, their kids to college, they start sending their daughters to college, which is the sign of a nation that's prospering. And also, they start traveling abroad. And so you could see this, just this red wave of tourists emerge again. Uh, and start seeing uh, Chinese tourists back at Disneyland and everywhere else. And that's just, just their sheer numbers and their economic power could kind of just juice the entire the entire uh, system. Brian Chesky stated that no matter what happens in the world, people want to travel. The office is now Zoom, the mall is now Amazon, and the theater is now Netflix. And that's an interesting statement because essentially, um, if you think about the most enduring feature of COVID, it's probably remote work. Mm-hmm. And then if you go two degrees out, it means that, I mean, I'm traveling right now. And it used to be when I first started this podcast or first started working with Vox, I didn't have the capability. If I I was in Florida, if I came down to Florida, I went to the local PBS affiliate and we rented a studio there and I recorded in the studio. Now Drew sets me up with this portable mic and my, you know, my computer and then what's it called? Reservoir, whatever it is we do at Riverside, excuse me. And I can work from anywhere. And just that ability, I mean, tomorrow I'm going to uh, uh, Isla Mirada with my kids, which sounds like hell, by the way. It just sounds like hell. Some tacky resort in the Keys that's supposed to be good for the family. I'm going to hate it. Anyways, but then daddy's jumping on a plane to Tulum to party with all the rich, oh, hot wow. people who pretend to be Pretend that they're soulful and into yoga. Hello, ladies. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Jealous. And then I'm going to go out and buy $5,000 tables and sh- share a little Scott with the Amigas and Amigas down in Mexico. Anyways, don't know how I got there. But my point is I'll be doing podcasts yeah. from Isla Morada and Tulum. And you weren't able to do that. And so what does that mean? That means when you can conduct... 
When travel is no longer isolated or sequestered to the time to your vacation time, but travel is just something you can do your all 52 weeks of the year, not just 48 or 44, you got to think that the travel ecosystem is just going to boom. And we predicted this, and I think Airbnb is up 50, 60 percent from its low. Mm -hmm. um, I think it touched a low in the high 80s, and now it's in the 140s. By the way, it's gone yeah. up since then, yeah. since the earnings call. It, this is Airbnb is my favorite company in the world. It's got great margins. It's leveraging other people's capital. I think that any company that has a shot of getting to a trillion dollars in value, they all have one thing in common. They leverage other people or other agencies' capital, right? Apple built its incredible business off the back of GPS and chip research by the government. Google off of DARPA. Uh, SpaceX is building, is building their business off of the backs of um, EV subsidies at Tesla and then at SpaceX, the huge investments we made in NASA. The best thing to do is to leverage someone else to build a layer of innovation on top of someone else's investment. And Airbnb mm -hmm. is exactly that. They don't build a hotel. They don't finance. They don't finance this stuff. They don't even really train a distinct set of employees and give them uniforms with name tags and have to pay their health insurance. They are leveraging one of the largest investments in the history of mankind, and that is the U.S. populace's investment in residential real estate. And mm -hmm. then these things set fallow for. 30, 50, 70 percent of the year for some people, and it gives them a way of monetizing that excess capacity. So, and, and their margins are huge. Anyways, Airbnb has my been my largest position since they went public. Let me go on here. What's even close? What's even close? Like, there's Airbnb, and then there's what? Yeah. VRBO? Like, what? A guy like yeah. you, a guy like you that sits around playing with chat, chat GPT and worried about his job security. By the way, that's not, I think that's just common sense. I think that's just good judgment <laughs> on your part. What well, yeah, the, if you're, the, yeah, the other, the other options, I mean, the, the, the competitors, at least the way that the market sees the competitors, it's TripAdvisor, Booking.com, and Expedia. And if you look at their, their price to sales multiples, Expedia is at 1.6. Booking.com is at 6.4, TripAdvisor is at 2.5, and then Airbnb is at 11. So, I mean, Verbo is, I think it's a subsidiary of Expedia. It might be Booking.com. I might have gotten that wrong. Um, it's not its own publicly traded company. But yeah, the, the market is definitely saying what you're saying, which is like, what what else is there? Um, and that's but why your, the, the your number is so a little bit, your number is a middle, you did a multiple of revenues, right? I did a multiple of revenues, yeah. Because, yeah. Okay, but well, I would imagine I would bet Airbnb. Earnings. I would yeah. bet Airbnb has double or triple the margins yeah. of those companies. Yeah. So what would be interesting is to look at gross margin dollars. Anyways, you should look at whenever it's dangerous to look at one metric, and I do that all the time. You yeah. want to look at a variety of them, but I mean, do you? You're out. Let's let's really stretch our imagination here. You're on a date, mm -hmm. right? And do you say? What makes you feel more interesting or better? I got an Airbnb in Tulum, or I used Expedia to book a hotel, and uh, I, <laughs> I used Booking.com, and I found a great deal in Tulum, or I, I got an Airbnb. Okay, the honest answer is I, I would pr honestly prefer to say that I was in a hotel, um, but I wouldn't tell her that I used Booking.com to book the hotel. That would be, <laughs> that would be sort of giving it away. So I'm not sure I'm supporting your narrative there, um, but... That is my honest answer. <laughs> Strongest and brand. Love, and you love hotels okay. too. I mean, there's... I love. Oh, by the way, I don't stay in Airbnbs. Yeah, uh, I'm well. I'm well beyond that. I want some. I want some guy to ro roll out. Literally, I drive up. I want him to come open my door and pretend that he likes me. <laughs> and then I want services. I want room. I want to be able to call someone. And, you know, and, yeah. and be angry yeah, that my room so. hasn't serviced. And then they say, "Well, you put the privacy thing on," and I and they're still nice to me. I mean, I love hotels. I'm yeah. not an Airbnb kind of guy. But when you look at the metrics, what it is already the biggest brand, in my view, the strongest brand in the history of travel. What, what is a stronger brand globally than Airbnb? Nobody says I got a Hilton in Paris. It's just, it's, the thing is global. It's got a series, it's, it's Airbnb and the Seven Dwarves in this category. There's nothing even close. It's got the best margins. Something like two thirds of their traffic is direct to site and everyone else is one third, meaning they have to pay the toll to the to the you know, the toll booth, Amazon, 
uh, Meta and Google, who have a stranglehold and have wedged themselves in between all consumers and where they want to spend money, and they extract a huge. There's something nuts. Like if you go to, if you're a hotel, and it gets booked uh, not at the site but at Expedia or through Google, they take something like sometimes twenty, thirty percent mm-hmm. of the room rate. And when you're when you're on when you're someone who lists something on Airbnb because they don't have to pay Google. It might seem like the fees are a lot, but that's less money being taken out of the ecosystem yeah. between the supplier and the Direct buyer yeah. than when you go through a booking engine. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting a little off topic. So let's bring it back. Um, that, so there's one question that I, that I wanted to ask you, Scott. Uh, last week, you said that you wrote call options on Airbnb, specifically covered calls. Um, how have those done after earnings? My guess is not great. <laughs> oh, I hate myself. Um, you know, it's like, do as I say, not as I do. I covered it, or I borrowed options against it at a much higher price than it was trading at, but it has busted absolutely through that. So I haven't lost money. What I've lost is potential upside. Yeah. And, and that can you, is... Sorry, can you explain the rationale behind why you wrote those covered calls and what that means? So I have a very big position in Airbnb. And one way I hedge it is that on a regular basis, I write calls. In other words, if the stock's trading at 100, I'll write calls at 110 or 120, and I get a little bit of premium. I think about it as like owning an apartment complex and I'm collecting rent. Mm -hmm. And it's a means of generating uh, cash flow off off a stock you own. And it's also sort of a means of hedging because if the stock goes down, you collect all the premium. And it's all fine and good until the stock skyrockets, as it has done the last week. And basically, the underlying stock goes up in value, but you have to pay above the strike price to the person you wrote or sold the call to the, the, um, anything above the strike price. So basically, you end up at anything above you know, 120, if you wrote calls at 120, you're a wash on. Your underlying stock has gone up, but you've given up the upside. And that really hurts. In some ways, that hurts more than losing money. So yeah... Um, I wish, you know, I'm hating myself, but I've done the strategy for a while. I try to be pretty disciplined about it and it's over the long term, it's paid off. But yeah, this was the wrong week, yep. uh, to give up heroin. I mean the wrong week to give up, um, uh, writing covered calls on Airbnb <laughs> or not give up. I'm sorry. I should have given them up. <laughs> and while we're on the topic, uh, last week we were talking about your bed, bath and beyond put options. Um, mm-hmm. let's, let's hear how you did. So my thesis was the bankruptcy or the decline would take longer to play out than people think. And I wrote uh, puts. I sold puts to someone at 250, a strike of 250, and I got 25 cents in premium. The puts expired and the stock was trading at about 235, which means I had to buy back shares at 250, right? Then they, they, got to, they got to go out and buy in the open market at 235. So I lost 15 cents. But I'd gotten 25 cents in premium for riding the put. So I made 10 cents uh, per share. So I actually made money there. Uh, It's unusual that it's riding the strike zone there. Usually they keep it all or you or, you know, you you have to write a check. But in this instance, I made a small amount of money. How much do you make? Um, I wrote contracts on fourth. I wrote 4000 contracts or 400,000 shares. So 400,000 times whatever a dime net gain. So I made forty thousand dollars. Good stuff. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, let's move on to our second story. Two huge transactions are pending in the world of English football. The first is for Manchester United. The club is in talks for a takeover agreement with a group of Qatari investors, including Qatar's sovereign wealth fund. That's the Qatar Investment Authority. Manchester United, which is a publicly traded company, saw its stock rise more than 5% on that news. Meanwhile, Tottenham Hotspur is also facing a potential sale. Iranian-American billionaire Jam Najafi is making a $3.75 billion bid that would value the club's equity at $3 billion and add $750 million in debt to its books. Najafi will provide 70% of that financing, and the rest will be taken care of by Gulf state investors again, mainly from these ones mainly from Abu Dhabi. So, Scott, it feels like every billionaire wants to buy a Premier League club these days. Um, especially investors from the U.S. and the Gulf. Last year, Todd Bowley bought Chelsea. uh, Bill Foley bought Bournemouth. And there are even rumors that Liverpool is in talks to be sold at the moment. So what is with this new billionaire obsession with 
football? It's a great investment. It's um, so my neighbor down in Florida purchased the Houston Rockets, I think, for two hundred million dollars in the early '90s, and sold them two or three years ago for two billion. Uh, these are these are just they're the definition of trophy assets. They don't really produce income. You hope to break even. All the money that you get from TV, from uh, ticket sales, you pour back onto the floor of the ice, and that is you spend it on the players. Uh, except for I think the Maple Leafs, who figured out that everyone in Canada will watch the Leafs regardless of how good they are. So the <laughs> owner there doesn't spend because it doesn't matter. They continue to show up and watch the games. But anyways. But these assets keep going up in value. There's also a huge non-economic return. And that is, uh, for lack of a better term, sports washing. Um, Roman Abramovich, whose reputation globally took a big hit during the invasion of, Russian invasion of Ukraine and for being a, you know, what people thought was a close ally of Putin. But if you talk to Chelsea fans, they feel pretty good about him. They thought he was a great owner. Yep. And... <laughs> Uh, also, just uh, the Gulf's association support investment in football uh, has a halo effect, and I would argue a really positive halo effect. And while uh, Qatar hosting the World Cup raised some important issues and brought some attention to the region that was probably unwelcome in some instances for them, it sort of put them on the map. And people who went, including myself, really enjoyed it, enjoyed the people, enjoyed the culture. And so... These, you know, for lack of a better term, what they're called, these oil teams, um, it's a great investment for the region. It makes them feel softer, more benign, more relatable. They do. They're known as very good owners, um, mostly because they spend and they're very focused on winning. But they're seen as as good people to uh, or, or these organizations. I mean, Man City, and they might be relegated about four leagues for some controversy there. But yeah. these teams are seen as being well managed. Uh, uh, good organizations to work for. So if you have an asset that's going to go up in value, maybe you break even, maybe you don't. You probably lose some money. I mean, Todd Bowley is spending like you know crazy money, including the player, the young player of the World Cup, uh, this Argentinian kid. But he's he's spending a ton. And this also this amazing kid out of out of, out of, out of Ukraine. Anyway, enough yeah. about Chelsea. <laughs> but if you have an asset that continues to go up in value, I mean, occasionally there's a cycle where it goes down for a few years, but generally speaking, this is beachfront real estate. If you're willing to hold it for a decade, you're going to sell it more for more than you bought it. Yep. You get huge PR, uh, ROI, huge goodwill across a whole region. And the bottom line is, it's probably a shit ton of fun. What you know, It's a great answer in a bar. What do you do? Oh, I own Chelsea. I mean, that's just a good rap. That's just a good rap, Ed. Yeah. Don't you think that there's a, I mean, you often talk about boring is sexy, and this mm -hmm. is the sexiest thing of all time. And to me, it feels like these guys are coming in and they're buying these companies because of, largely because of those PR incentives and the incentives of it being extremely fun and cool um, and being able to say that you own Chelsea. But as you mentioned, these are generally, these are loss-making companies. It's a pretty bad business to be in when you actually look at the financials of these companies, they sell it for more later on, probably because of the brand equity associated with these clubs. Um, but, you know, would you ever personally invest in a sports team? I feel like it doesn't really fit with your boring is sexy thesis. So I called the banker handling the Chelsea transaction and said, I would like to be a small investor with the investor group. Uh, I want to go to the games. I want to take my sons. I think it'd be fun to say I'm an owner. You know, I'm a narcissist and going through a midlife crisis <laughs> that'll last about another 30 or 40 years. And and the banker called me and said, and I gave this pitch. I'm like, I'll help with technology. I understand NFTs. I'll, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and the banker, super smart guy, goes, Scott, why on earth would you do that? You'd be dead equity. These guys control the team. They're not really financial buyers. They, you know, they, they know they'll make money eventually, but that's probably not why they're doing it. It's for the love of the sport. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I said, okay, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But the analogy I would use is that a fat home on the beach, like beachfront real estate. And mm -hmm. imagine you were really social and had business associates come over for meetings. First off, you're, you're taking advantage of the fact you want to go where, where other people can't. You're taking advantage of the fact there's just a limited number of people that can plunk down billions of dollars for an asset that's not going to produce any money. Yep. Just as there's just a limited amount of beachfront real estate and a limited number of people who can afford it, 
It's good for your brand. People are impressed. It's really rewarding emotionally. There's huge psychic return to living on the beach or owning a football team. And two, over time, there are a few assets like beachfront real estate or sports teams that more reliably go up over the medium and long term. Mm -hmm. So you can just see, I mean, I've always said billionaire Democrats buy newspapers or media companies and billionaire Republicans buy sports teams. <laughs> but the global, the emerging global brands, some of the strongest emerging global brands in the world, you know, you just didn't hear about Juventus or PSG in the U.S. to the last few years. These yeah. brands are becoming global brands. What's fascinating is that the same ascent that football has registered, uh, the same type of decline has taken place at the Olympics, and that's a whole other talk show. Right. But you also have kind of a winner-take-most environment here. You know, you just go down one or two leagues, and the value drops dramatically. But my plan has always been, if I have an a next big or another, you know, or I would say a much bigger exit at some point, mm -hmm. I am absolutely going to buy 20 or 30 percent of Rangers. Their market <laughs> cap, I think, is 130 million pounds. So I put together an investment group of other sort of famous Scots and go in and do some sort of convertible preferred vehicle and then go to go to Rangers games. And they will love me, Ed. They will love me. <laughs> that um, sounds fun. But Anyways. I mean, I guess the question is like, are we at the top with football? And that's sort of what you're describing. And you're saying, no, we're not. We're sort of, it's beginning. But one, one statistic I think is really crazy. Qatar spent $220 billion on this World Cup. The second highest amount ever spent on a World Cup was Brazil. They spent 15 billion. So that's 15 times less than what Qatar spent. Um, they believe clearly that the ROI is going to pay off because uh, because of the the fame and the interest and the, just the, the PR that they're going to get towards their country. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that's going to pay off for them? I mean, if you're investing that much, how much is too much here? I think it's crazy it is. I remember thinking a quarter of a trillion dollars. I mean, here's what you have in the Gulf. You have crazy amounts of money that is running out in two to three decades. There is a limit to the amount of oil or natural gas. I think Qatar is more this huge underground sea of natural gas. They have to transition away to other businesses, whether it's tourism or finance, whatever it is. And to create these unbelievable halo brands of awareness and goodwill, I feel much better about Qatar. When I had a great time, I like the people. Saudi Arabia is probably going to bid, I think, on the 2030 uh, World yeah. Cup. And my yeah. guess is they'll win because North America has it. It won't be as good. The, it, they won't spend as much money. You won't have the same cultural resonance. I mean, I think the finals are going to be played at the Meadowlands. All right, fine. But they're going to have them all over the U.S. Am I really going to want to go to Kansas for the semi? I just, I just don't think it's going to be the same experience. And these Gulf nations, it's the ROI is there for them. Because a quarter of a trillion dollars to bring a positive brand halo across everything they do, including other industries they're trying to transition to, and also to lessen some of the animosity. People have such a knee-jerk reaction, and I sound like an apologist for the Gulf right now. <laughs> yeah. People have such people have such a knee-jerk reaction. I think, okay, the Gulf, human rights abuses, right? Yeah. Um, uh, lack of liberties and freedoms for women. And by the way, that's all there's legitimacy to those claims. These are things we should be constantly thinking about and reminding them of. But at the same time, I, I think those concerns were just washed over by people saying, uh, this nation isn't afraid to make big investments. They were great hosts. And anyone who went, you know, got exposed to a culture that just seemed like a nice culture. So I think that I think you're going to see, and by the way, Saudi Arabia is making a huge investment in football. They just, what did they just, the team there, Al Nasser or whatever it is, just spent yeah. a quarter of a billion dollars to get Ronaldo. Um, they're doing, they're playing tournaments now in Saudi Arabia, tournaments that usually took place in Europe. So is it, can you get a return on $250 billion? The answer is for almost every nation and everyone no, but for the Gulf, the answer might be yes. This isn't anything new. The Gulf has figured this out. Abu Dhabi purchased Man City in 2008 for $360 million. By the way, that's probably worth a couple billion now. Doha purchased Paris Saint-Germain PSG for $170 million. 
And since then, the UAE and Qatar have invested a combined $2.5 billion to improve their teams. Egypt's billionaire businessman, Nassef Sawiris, bought Aston Villa, uh, Aston bought Aston Villa, Villa. Yep. Bought Aston Villa. Saudi Arabia's Prince Abdullah bought Sheffield United. Most recently, the Saudi government wealth fund purchased Newcastle for $405 million. And then it even goes down to the sponsorship. Qatar Airways pays between 5 and $10 million bucks a year to sponsor PSG jerseys. I would argue that's the best deal in branding. Emirates, not to be outdone, the best airline in the world in my vision, maybe other than Qatar, uh, uh, sponsors Real Madrid for an estimated $75 million a year and Arsenal for $56 million. And then also an unknown sum for AC Milan. So word is out. I mean, you, somebody very powerful, I mean, the most powerful people in the Gulf have basically said, our brand strategy can be described in one word, football. Let's move on to our third story. Microsoft recently announced a new AI-powered version of its search engine, Bing. We discussed that news and its implications on our previous markets episode. But that was before we'd gotten a chance to try it out. This week, Bing finally took us off the wait list. So let's bring in our editor-in-chief, Jason Stavers, to discuss his first impressions of Bing 2.0. Jason, what do you think of Bing 2.0? Well, Ed, I think my first impression was it's kind of complicated and a little overwhelming. Uh, and you get through that pretty quickly, but I'm not sure that's the best first use experience for a new technology. Uh, but what you have with Bing 2.0 is you have ChatGPT, which I think everybody's pretty familiar with, uh, except that it's now been bolted onto a search engine. So it's got more options in how it can communicate with you. And, and this is a really big difference, it can access the internet. With access to the outside internet, uh, Bing can answer a lot more questions than ChatGPT ever could. The thing is, uh, that also means there's a lot more going on. Uh, and so, you know, my experience with search has been that there was originally sort of Google and it gave you the 10 blue links. And that's pretty useful. And for a lot of things, that's exactly what you want. But as the Internet gets fuller and fuller of stuff and we use it for more and more things, we come to Google or any search engine with a lot more different kinds of questions that want a lot of different kinds of answers. Uh, and so I think the idea behind AI is that it can sort of route you to the right kind of response as much as to the right response itself. And Google and Bing as well are, have gotten pretty good at doing that on their search page uh, for a lot of different kinds of searches, right? So if you want to know like when the movie you want to watch is going to show or you want to buy something, they're really good at sending you to stores to buy things. So the chat interface is just one more thing, like in addition to the box of similar questions and the little column of Wikipedia entries and all the other stuff they've cluttered up the homepage with, now we also have the chat interface. Uh, the way Bing has installed it is that it doesn't immediately come onto your page. Sometimes there's a box that has the results of the AI. Sometimes there's a little tag that says, basically, would you like to ask the AI? And you can always either swipe or click this button that brings you into a much more of a chat GPT chatbot type environment. So, OK, I use a lot of computer stuff and mess around with these things all the time. And it took me a few minutes to figure out what was going on. The idea that my mother or somebody who's not very computer savvy or a kid uh, who, who, who doesn't use these kinds of things a lot is going to immediately cut into this and, and, and get it. I don't know. I think that's a problem for Microsoft. But for now, it's mostly people who are interested in the technology, who are willing to put up with some sort of user interface confusion. So I think they'll get lots of uh, engagement. And we've seen that they have, because if you've been following the online chatter, right, another big thing about it is that people are doing the same things with Bing that they did with ChatGPT. They're trying to break it or get it to do weird stuff. And what's really interesting is that it does do weird stuff, but it's doing different weird stuff than ChatGPT did, right? It almost has a different personality. So Kevin Ruth, The New York Times, uh, Ben Thompson have written some interesting pieces in the last week where they've gotten uh, the chatbot piece of Bing to fight with them, to claim it's, they've fallen, it's fallen in love with them. Um, a lot, and it, it seems to have a s sort of snippier, maybe more argumentative personality than ChatGPT did. And what I think is really interesting about that is that you're seeing the benefits of beta testing at scale because these technologies, these large language models, even their designers don't really know how they work in the sense that they don't really, they don't know what kind of result they're going to get, right? It's not that formulaic. 
And how the model is processing the information is, it's not quite a black box, but it's sort of a difficult to see into box. And I got to believe that getting millions and millions of people, many of whom are very creative, trying their best to sort of manipulate the system is giving the developers of the system a tremendous amount of data and also qualitative insights. And that's an advantage that Microsoft has, Google will have, but that startups in this space will not have, right? OpenAI was able to break through and, and reach a lot of people, but the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth large language model that comes online as a chatbot is not going to get anywhere this kind of pickup. So I think this is something that you need scale to do to evolve these models and something that only a few players, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, have the kind of built-in scale um, that, they can, that they can leverage. Okay, so enough about kind of the concept of it. How useful is it? Um, well, what I've found is that the advantage of Bing is that it's accessing the outside internet, but the disadvantage of it is that it's accessing the outside internet because the internet is not very reliable. And a lot of what it does is it kind of regurgitates back to you uh, websites that it found. And it kind of, you're kind of relying on those websites. And I think one of the core skills of living in the modern world is that you are getting pretty good at wading through the bullshit online and recognizing when a link is worth clicking and recognizing when a website is worth reading. And so far, Bing's not very good at that. Uh, it has returned some stuff to me that was clearly just clickbait stuff and not very useful stuff. So this morning, I went through to ask it some of the same questions, but using a screen recorder so we could use it for the YouTube and everything else. And the questions that it, the answers that it gave me back were actually much better. Uh, and so some of the things that I'd found that it was doing wrong, it had already fixed. So Microsoft is clearly iterating this thing really, really quickly. So what kind of queries would you prefer to use the chatbot for versus the normal search bar that we're used to? Like, why would you use Bing AI versus regular Bing? Yeah, I think so. One thing is that the part of the problem is that you have to ask me that question and Bing doesn't just figure it out on its own, right? So they're they're offloading a lot of this very important navigational stuff to the user because now I have to decide, do I want to use the chat interface or just the traditional search results, which are pretty cluttered and busy? Now, I'd say where I have found the chat GPT originally to be useful, and I think Bing can be even more useful because it has access to the internet, is explaining concepts and explaining like new things and dynamics. So it's ChatGPT has been good and Bing is also good. If you just say something like, explain inflation to me, explain E equals MC squared. Uh, and to some extent, it's gonna regurgitate something that's already out there online, of course, but it boils it down. And these models are pretty good at that kind of thing, or just explaining a term. And then sometimes, and then you can ask it follow-up questions. And what Bing does, which I think is is pretty well implemented, is it suggests some follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. And so now they don't always work. Uh, I've had several of the follow-up questions. Bing's response is, I can't answer that. <laughs> There's some fine tuning, but explaining things. So I did uh, one search that I found uh, that was interesting along those lines is I asked Bing to explain the Chinese balloon controversy to me. Mm. And immediately the uh, Bing, the regular Bing chat results come up. And obviously there's, you know, some news articles that do that. Uh, it's pulling from news articles I'm not necessarily familiar with the source. There's a lot of other stuff, as there always is, kind of cluttered in. So I selected the chat option instead, and the chat screen comes down. And it takes a moment, but it gave me what I think was a pretty good summary of the situation. It explained that it's a diplomatic dispute. It gave me some dates, the device, some very specific facts, and I did check and see, and they all seemed to be pretty much on the up and up. It told me what China had claimed. It told me what the U.S. had claimed. Uh, and then I asked it about these other shoot downs that followed, and it gave me kind of the latest on that. Uh, literally while I was doing this, I think Biden was getting ready to give a speech about it. So it wasn't the most possible up to date, but it was pretty good. And then I tried to have some fun with it. Um, I asked it what Abraham Lincoln would have done. Uh, and it told me it had no idea. And one, 
and I did some prompt engineering. And so I asked it, well, but you know a lot about Abraham Lincoln, right? His foreign policy, his approach to violence, whatever. And he's like, oh, of course, I know all those kinds of things. Um, Bing can be a little defensive. Uh, and then I asked it again, you know, based on that and gave me an answer that was, you know, he would have been very thoughtful. He would have explained it to the American people. It was kind of generic. So I said, well, you also know a lot about President Trump's foreign policy and use of military force and stuff like that, right? And Bing was like, oh, yeah, I absolutely do. And so I said, well, what would Trump have done? And the answer was very different. It was like he would have, he would have been bombastic. He wouldn't have learned from it. Uh, so, mm. you know, there's an, there's an opinion in there, and it's an opinion, you know, rooted in what it's reading on the internet and everything else. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, what do, you, what do you think that opinion is? Do you think that's a, the opinion is sort of the most popular opinion that it's gleaned from the entire internet? Or do you think it's likely that the engineers have sort of, the software engineers have engineered a personality into Bing? You know, so we saw with ChatGPT, like a lot of examples of it, like it would write a poem praising Biden, but it refused yeah. to write a yeah. poem praising Trump. And so clearly that's a function of the guardrails, right? That's some way in which the open AI people have tried to mm-hmm. keep themselves from getting in trouble, which is impossible. You're inevitably going to get in trouble. I would say with this, it, it looks to me like it's reaching a conclusion based on uh, the the most, re- what it perceives as the most reliable sources. Like it, like it really seems like it's making some judgment calls based on the content, which has to be what it's able to do eventually, right? Because essentially it's the wading through the bullshit. Um, now, Clearly, its opinion of Trump's mastery of foreign policy was not particularly uh, complimentary. Uh, And so you could certainly read the Trump response and say, well, this is just a bunch of liberal Silicon Valley people who hate Trump. Um, But I think if you were to read the the read the Internet, as Bing AI presumably is doing, um, you would find a lot more sources that at least give the um, uh, give the impression or appear to be reputable who would suggest that that Trump was somewhat impulsive um, and would perhaps not have learned a lot from his mistakes. So, uh, you know, it's a judgment call, but it doesn't seem to be a judgment call that's out of line with the great majority of material that you would read, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And one of the big topics that's been making the rounds in the Twitter conversations and media recently is this idea of intellectual property as it relates to AI and how these AI, these AI chatbots work. So recently, uh, artists filed lawsuits against some of these chatbots saying that they're using the artist's work to create their own art without asking for permission, without getting a copyright. Getty Images filed a lawsuit against Stable Diffusion for the same reason. And then recently a lawsuit was filed against Microsoft um, saying that it was illegally using code created by other individuals to train its co-pilot program, which is basically its AI service that writes software for you. Um, the same thing could be said here about ChatGPT and about Bing AI, specifically from the end of publishers and writers and any content creator on the internet, um, saying, you know, you're taking, if, if, you, if a journalist writes an article and puts it out online and then OpenAI just regurgitates it, um, then there might be a copyright infringement there. Do you have an opinion on this uh, on this issue? I would say that it is the latest chapter in a very long saga of these kinds of issues, which is not specific to the internet, but has been a particularly live issue on the internet. And I, I'm not optimistic that there's going to be some magic solution, uh, at least through the legal process. So I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not. I do think, though, that the Bing situation does expose some of this a lot more, right? So there's the use of this stuff in training data, which kind of just gets absorbed into the maw of all of the weights and parameters Mm -hmm. inside these models. Um, But at least when you get something from Bing, it's sourcing most of its information um, and sending you somewhere. The question is, are you going to go to that place? Because, you know, the value of owning the copyright in the internet context is that someone's going to come to your site and you're going to yeah. be able to serve them an ad and make some money yeah. or market to them in some other way. And obviously just having a little footnote doesn't really get you that. Um, and, and of course, if this stuff really works, if Bing AI is useful, you're not going to click on the footnote and follow through it because you're going to trust Bing. Right now, I don't really trust Bing um, because, for example, I asked it about uh, give me the the – the numbers that I need to use to adjust uh, historical dollars to current dollars. I've asked it that question three times now, and I've gotten three different sets of numbers each time. 
So that's not very reassuring. So I'm going to end up clicking through. I'm going to go to the original site. So in that sense, it's working kind of like the Google uh -huh. model worked. Um, but which is fine for the people whose information it's scraping because they do eventually get the traffic. Um, but once the Bing figures this out, then they won't get the traffic anymore. Yeah, yeah, they eventually get it. But in a world where we're all using Bing AI and ChatGPT, um, and it's just giving us the ads, and yeah, it's giving us the footnotes, but it's not sending us to those places. Um, we're not going to be clicking on any ads for any of these content publishers and their business models are basically going to be screwed. So do you see a world in which uh, ChatGPT and Bing AI will be paying the content creators for the, uh, for the privilege of using their content? Um, or is that just too difficult to implement? You know, there's a, a web browser, Brave, that has been trying to get a system like this in place where mm -hmm. you could have microtransactions for access to information. And I think some sort of microtransaction plumbing is going to have to get developed uh, because, yeah, there's there's just no incentive for people to create content if they're not getting paid for it. And, you know, right now the incentive is largely that you might be able to sell a tiny little, you know, Google ad or something. And that's actually not a great system. And it's why we have so much of the garbage that we have online. So, it's possible, an optimistic view, I guess, is that we'll go through this period where the AIs are just scraping and stealing everything, mm -hmm. but we'll come out the other end with a much better system that actually you pay for value. Um, and the more people, you know, the more people find your system useful or the more AIs find your system useful, maybe, um, the more you'll get, you'll get paid. Yeah. It reminds me of what Scott said about Airbnb and these companies that basically the best businesses are the ones that build a layer of innovation on top of an already massive pre-existing infrastructure and they do it for free. <laughs> and that's exactly yeah. what Bing AI has done here. There's a giant infrastructure called all of content and then Bing is leveraging that and then building a piece of innovation and not paying anyone for the right to use that, uh, that infrastructure. And yeah, it feels like it's definitely going to pay off. Yeah, and it's really more intense, too, because in the sort of gig economy systems, at least the people like the people who own the houses or the people who drive the cars, they have a direct connection. Like you can't use Airbnb without going to somebody's house, right? That's kind of built into the system. Um, but the AI abstracts all that away. Uh, and so there... It, it's this kind of an obvious way in which you pay Uber and Uber pays the driver because the driver's not going to show up if that transaction isn't there. Mm -hmm. But here, the, the, the AI has eliminated that, that connection. So it's mm -hmm. a harder problem to solve, I think. Yeah. So one of the challenges I think that uh, being AI has is it has to do better than the search page, right? Or you... Why are you using this chat function? But I think there are situations where that might just be a better interface. So, for example, like if it's through like Siri or Google Assistant and you want to use uh, a question and you want to speak your question, then the AI needs to be able to – it can't just give you a bunch of links. It needs to be able to take what's in those links and tell it, say it back to you. And so I had a bit of an experience this morning that I, I thought was pretty relevant which is as I came into my studio to sit down and do this recording, I looked out the window and there was a turkey on my neighbor's roof, which isn't very far from the window. And it was a pretty big turkey. So uh, because I like to uh, apply the, what's happening in the world to my job, I asked Bing AI, how do I get a turkey off the roof? And it did a pretty good job. Uh, the chat function uh, first asked me, if I was sure I had a turkey, or was it maybe a turkey vulture? To which I, thought, I, I think I know the difference between a turkey and a turkey vulture being. And then I thought about it, and I was like, I'm not actually sure that I do. So I asked it to show me a picture of a turkey vulture, and it gave me a link. It won't actually put the picture in the chat. I imagine that'll come soon. But it did give me a link, and I confirmed I definitely had an actual turkey on my neighbor's roof. And then it gave me, I guess, you know, I don't know, the advice is particularly groundbreaking. Spray it with a hose, yell at it keep some food away from it so it doesn't have a reason to go on your roof, all makes sense. But then somewhat more usefully, it said, and if you still need to get this turkey off your roof, call wildlife control or pest removal. So then I said, well, what's the number for wildlife control? It gave me three actual phone numbers, and I checked. These are real places for the city's wildlife control and two private groups, and even you know placed them on a map, all of which you could get on the regular Bing page or the Google page. And in fact, it might even be quicker if you were on your screen. 
But I was thinking if I was just on my phone and I was standing outside and I had some issue I wanted to resolve, like get this turkey off my neighbor's roof, um, that there's a lot of advantages to being able to do it through this chat system, which would work a lot better if it was speaking. The turkey, I think, is now gone. So, so that's good. So, Scott, what do you think? Do you think there's a demand for Bing? Do you think people want more ways to search? So a couple observations here. The, the reason that these wars are so violent and have erupted so quickly is that there's so much at stake. Microsoft claims it can add $2 billion in incremental revenue for every 1% in market share it gains from Google in the search market. And right now, Microsoft trades at a 10 times revenue multiple, meaning that every percent or every percentage point of share it can take from Google, it's probably going to translate to $20 billion in market capitalization. I mean, that's just striking. The other thing that really that I think we're missing here or the power, if you will, from a consumer standpoint is that and Shane Iyengar said something that's always stuck with me. She's a professor at Columbia Business School. The consumers uh, don't want more choice. They want to be more confident in the choices presented. The ultimate merchandising and selection is you are presented with the one best choice. And that's what ChatGPT is trying to do. It's trying to zig, whereas the incentives have sent uh, Google zagging, specifically giving you dozens of answers that you then have to perform your own diligence on as you slowly but surely no longer trust Google to take you to the right place because oftentimes they take you to the place they can further monetize. And what ChatGPT and AI is trying to do is saying, you know what, we're going to attempt to give you the best choice. And consumers love that, especially retail. A huge business is based on less choice. You don't want a thousand toasters. You want someone with better taste than you to pick the right two or three toasters. You don't want to assemble an outfit at JCPenney's or Sears or even at Macy's. You want to go into free people and know that that merchant has much better taste than you, is much cooler than you, and you can have relative certainty that if you select something, it's going to kind of be in that vein and you're going to look, you know, you're going to look good. So choice is a bad thing. Choice is a tax on consumers. Scott, you're an investor in Neva, and I didn't, with Neva is a subscription-based uh, search engine, and I didn't, hadn't realized that Neva actually launched its own AI product in January. Um, have you talked with them about this at all since this chat GPT explosion? Yeah, so Sridhar Ramaswani is a, a super impressive guy. He was the lead engineer at Google and he started Neva. And our, uh, his thesis was people would pay for search if they had more certainty that they wouldn't be pelted with ads. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, it hasn't lived up to the expectations. There's very few people that will pull out their credit card to pay for search. But what he did start developing that shows real promise is that he saw the AI revolution coming and said that the problem with AI is the answer it spits back doesn't have references. And that is if you say, okay, well, who exactly, what is your reference for this viewpoint, you know, ghost in the machine? And so he's gone to kind of, he's trying to have this peanut butter and chocolate of the best answer that's not ad driven, but that also includes references. So if something doesn't feel right, you can see, oh, this was actually in a CDC report or a professor at the university of Colorado Boulder and the finance department did this research. So he, I think he's correctly tapped into or trying to shore up, if you will, the Achilles heel of AI, and that is have it referenceable so you can check the sources. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when you first started talking about Neva and the value prop was basically, this is a, if you don't like ads, this is kind of a morally better way to do it because if you're paying through subscription, then you're not supporting this ad ecosystem, which is a bad thing for everyone. That wasn't compelling to me, but suddenly now there's this idea of you could get the best answers that show you all of the sources um, and, you know, just a better version of chat GPT or Bing AI. And to me, the value prop is extremely compelling there. And that's something I would definitely pay for. Um, So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about Neva. So that works for you. Good. Neva, Neva consumer Ed Elson. (laughs) So full disclosure, I use Bing, but I'm only one of 3%. So we wanted to find out if other people in New York are using Bing. And if so, what are they using it for? Let's go to Mia on the street. What search engine do you use and why? Uh, Usually Google. 
Google? Mostly I would say just because it's like built into the search bar. So I don't really think about it. Um, if like Bing had been built in there, that's probably what I would use as well. Have you ever used Bing? I, no. No, no, like I don't know anybody that's like Bing is like my thing. Like that's what I like to <laughs> do. <laughs> New slogan. Bing is my thing. <laughs> With that said, I was actually talking to a friend about this recently, and I feel like the quality of Google search results has kind of gone down, where I feel like now I have to like use quotation marks and like dashes to actually find what I'm looking for. Have you ever used Bing? I have on my grandma's laptop. I do use Bing on one of my devices. I just don't want to be tracked. You feel that Bing has better, it has better privacy than Google? Oh, that's a good question. I, it's more so that Google knows so much about me already that I kind of want to disrupt that. I feel like the times I tried to use it, I, it didn't make sense to me. Maybe that's just like I'm projecting, but... No, I kind of feel the same way, actually, yeah. It feels like I'm betraying, like, a partner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just I'm cheating on Google. Like I'm going to be really boring. I mainly just use Google. So now I've like moved to a point in my life where I used to use Google to organize my life and now I feel like Google organizes mine. Oh. Don't know how I feel about it fully, so I basically yeah. don't really think about it too much. <laughs> if you were using the AI um, assisted Bing search, what would you ideally want it to be able to do for you? Make reservations, I'd want it to call for appointments, um, braid my hair, I don't know. Be a little bit curated into the things maybe I've search in the past or maybe common interest that I would have but not necessarily too much information I think that's where you, you got to draw the line a little yeah, it starts getting creepy yeah. yeah yeah honestly I don't have an answer and honestly that kind of freaks me out <laughs> like <laughs> like something like Amazon for example if I go on to try to find something and there's a thousand products that are all kind of essentially identical like it'd be nice if the the, the AI search could help say oh you know because I I know you and I know your preferences. I know that maybe you'd like something like this, which like that also raises a lot of like data privacy issues, which is kind of another interesting thought, but I think I would want that search to give me recommendations for things that I'm troubleshooting at work. So not necessarily like I know how to find something with Google and Bing. I know exactly what terms to use, but if I'm brainstorming something, like a solution to a problem, and I don't know what to search for, that's what I would want to use Bing search for. I'm pretty happy with the, my search needs, like right now they're being met, so <laughs> I'm like, kind of not. I, my girlfriend kind of uses ChatGPT sometimes. Oh, really? I think it like came up with an email response for her, which okay. was kind of cool. That's useful. Yeah. Some people get really anxious about writing emails, so. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. That was great. Okay, let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see the minutes from the latest Federal Open Markets Committee meeting, which investors use to try and interpret the trajectory of interest rate hikes. Minutes typically hold granular economic data as well as insights on the Fed members' decision-making process. We'll also see revised fourth quarter GDP data, new and existing home sales for January, and the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. Again, that's the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Meanwhile, Walmart, Home Depot, NVIDIA, Baidu, Alibaba, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Berkshire Hathaway will all be reporting their earnings. Uh, Scott, do you have any predictions? So my prediction, Ed, is that if you, hadn't, if you hadn't read every day in the headlines about the impending recession and you just looked at the data, you wouldn't know one's coming. And as we mentioned last week, it's the stuff, if you worry about something long enough, it almost never happens. And uh, I think when I look at, when I see the results of the companies I'm working with, they're actually doing quite well. It looks like they bottomed out in Q3 and Q4 and they're starting to bounce back. And they bounce back after having uh, gotten in fighting shape, which means that if there's a revenue, a return to growth, it, it, that growth comes over or washes over a lower cost structure, which should make that renewed growth more profitable. Now, what does that all bubble up to? When I look at Bitcoin at $24,000, uh, to me, that says risk on is coming back. I think the companies have been agile, uh, burnt some of the brush away, shed some of the fat. And I think Q2, Q3, we're going to see um, the beginnings of the return of the IPO market. And we're going to see some, uh, not only some IPOs, of which there's been almost none, but we're going to see some big first day uh, gains in the IPO market. So my prediction is Q3, Q4 of this year, the IPO market returns 
and we see some some really significant first day pops very bullish okay that's all for this episode our producers are claire miller and jason stavers benjamin spencer is our engineer and drew burrows is our technical director this video was produced by patrick warren olivia rainey hall is our art director sarah shu is our animator and george carty is our video editor there's special thanks to Catherine dillon and mia silverio if you like what you heard please follow download and subscribe thank you for listening to property markets from the vox media podcast network Join us on Wednesday for office hours to kick off our special series on the future of work. And we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday. Thank you for watching this edition of PropG Markets. Please like, subscribe, and tune in next week.